Welcome to Programming with Python. My name is Stefan Güttel. I am a lecturer in the Department of Mathematics at the University of Manchester, and I'm very happy to welcome you to this programming course. This course teaches the fundamentals of programming, the most basic concepts using the programming language Python. Before I get started with this week's uh, lecture material, I'd like to make two remarks. The first remark is that this video should only be the second video you're watching for this course. There is an important first video called Course Introduction, which you can find on the course website. This course introduction video explains how you can make best use of the lecture materials that are provided, how you can make best use of the exercises that are provided on a weekly basis, how the assessment works and so on. Most importantly, the course introduction video also explains how to download and install the Anaconda distribution to your computer. Anaconda is a collection of software that works very nicely together in order for you to get started with Python very quickly and easily. Part of this Anaconda distribution is a program called Spider. I'll just show you quickly how Spider looks on my computer. Here it is. It will look very similar on your own computer. So once you have downloaded and installed Anaconda, you should be able to start up Spider by typing Spider in your search box over here, or you can also use um, the start menu on the bottom left of your Windows computer. On a Mac, you would find a very similar way of starting up Spider. Once you have done that, you can type Python code in the editor, which is this window on the left side here. So I can type some Python, print hello, for example, and then I can run this code by just hitting the green arrow over here, or I can type F5 on my keyboard. And on the bottom right here, this is the so-called console, you will see the outputs of your programs. So as you can see, in this case, our short Python program has simply printed the string hello to the console. Now, this will be very useful for us because we can copy and paste Python codes that are in the lecture materials directly to this editor and run it, right? And we can modify them and play interactively with codes. So what happens when I change the value of a variable to something else? What happens if I remove this line over here and so on? So please make use of this interactive way of working through the lecture notes. It's much more fun to actually do programming yourself instead of just watching me code in these videos. So get started with Spider as soon as possible. I would highly recommend doing this. The second remark I have is that the lecture notes that you see in this video are also provided in form of PDFs on the course website. Furthermore, there is a hyperlinked timestamped version of these videos available for you. So you can quickly navigate between different parts of the lecture in order for you to find very quickly the parts that you are most interested in. So for example, if you want to revise what I have explained about algorithms, you can use these hyperlinked videos to very quickly navigate to the part in the lectures where algorithms are explained. So hopefully this way of working will make it very efficient for you to revise the lecture materials. Now in this week's lecture, I would like to cover essentially four topics. The first one is to clarify what are algorithms and what are programs? What is the distinction between an algorithm and a program? We will discuss some basic input and output in Python. We will learn about variables, types, and operators. And at the end, I will show you some examples where we run into trouble when working with floating point numbers on a computer. Let us first focus on the question of what is an algorithm? There are various ways to define or describe what an algorithm is, but for our purposes, let's just look at this definition here. According to this definition, an algorithm is a sequence of actions 
that are always executed in a finite number of steps used to solve a certain problem. Now a bit more informally, you can think of an algorithm as a cookbook, okay? A book of recipes to prepare food. Now, the most important parts that most algorithms share are the following. We first want to get some input data to work on. We then solve a problem by transforming that input data. And once we have obtained our solution, we want to output it. So we want to return a result of a computation. Here's an intuitive example that hopefully makes the concept a bit clearer. Assume we want to prepare a frozen pizza. We take the box that contains the pizza and we read off the temperature and time that it takes for the pizza to be prepared. Now, temperature and time here would be the input data of our algorithm. Once we have this data, we can start our algorithm by heating the oven to the pre-specified pre temperature, discarding all the packaging and cooking for time t. Okay, so this is clearly a finite sequence of steps that we need to complete in order to prepare the pizza. And if we've done this successfully, we can then output the result. We can retrieve the prepared pizza from the oven. Now, sometimes when we execute algorithms, we run into unforeseen problems. For example, if we forget to put on heat resistant gloves uh, when we operate the oven, then we might burn our hands and maybe even have to go to the emergency room, right? So such events that are unforeseen are called exceptions in the language of programming. We will learn more about exceptions later on in the course. So just to recall, the input data is temperature and time. We then have a finite sequence of steps that operates on this, on this data. And in the final step, we return the result. So this is the essence of an algorithm. Now, by contrast, what is a program? You will have noticed that the algorithm that I've written down here is specified in the English language. Now, if you go to Italy, for example, and you buy a pizza from the supermarket and you prepare it, then you will have to follow instructions that are most likely written in the Italian language. So this shows that the concept of an algorithm is quite abstract. It's just this finite sequence of steps that we have to follow in order to achieve a certain output. But the language that we use to specify these steps is almost arbitrary. It could be English, it could be Italian, or if we want the algorithm to run on a computer, we should use a language that can actually be understood by a computer. Now, Python is one of such languages and they are commonly referred to as computer programming languages. A computer program is a sequence of precise instructions written in some computer programming language like Python. Our focus in this course will be on algorithms and not necessarily programs. We will use computer programs to test algorithms and see how they work. But the big aim of this course is for you to learn how to solve problems using a computer, regardless of the choice of programming language. So if you see a problem in the future that can be solved in principle by an algorithm, then you should be able to use other programming languages as well. For example, C or Java. And the skills that you learn here will be transferable in the sense that you should be able to solve every problem that can be formulated in terms of an algorithm. Let's briefly discuss different types of programming languages that exist. There are two main classes, so-called compiled and interpreted programming languages. Now, compiled programming languages take code that is written in a compiled language and translate them into machine code. Machine code is the code that the computer can actually understand, which popularly 
speaking is often referred to as zeros and ones. Computers are not able to actually understand C code or Python code for that matter. This code needs to be translated to a sequence of zeros and ones. Compiled languages have the property that they are strictly typed. Um, we will understand this a bit better later on. It means that variables need to have precisely predefined, pre-declared data types, and they are usually faster to run than interpreted codes. Interpreted codes are translated during the execution. So the code is translated as we are running the program on our computer, step by step. Interpreted languages are often untyped or loosely typed, and they run slower than compiled languages because this translation procedure to going from the code to zeros and ones is done as the code is executing. And because this translation takes time, interpreted languages typically run slower than compiled ones. Now, Python turns out to be in the letter class, it is an interpreted language. However, Python programs get semi-translated when they are run. Python has something which is called a pseudo compiler. And this actually means that Python programs can be, although they are interpreted, rather efficient when the code is well written. In particular, there are some libraries that one can use in order to speed up Python programs sufficiently for many practical purposes. Like every language, Python and other programming languages as well evolve over time. Okay, Python is not set in stone and there are many implementations available of Python and two major versions. There's Python version 2 and Python version 3. We will be mainly using Python version 3 throughout this course. Um, I will sometimes highlight what are the differences if you were to adapt the same code to Python version 2, but you don't actually need to worry about this too much. It's enough to know about Python 3. Now, if we look at our spider uh, program in the title bar, it actually tells me that this spider is currently running Python version 3.7. So that's one of the uh, three versions of Python. Okay, so we are now in the position to write our first Python code. It's written here. This is a one-line program, one-line Python program, which is called Hello World. Hello World is a very simple test program that is used to demonstrate the syntax of programming languages. Let's just try this out. So I'm gonna go to spider here and I will now type print hello world. Like so, gonna execute this. And well, we have done a very similar example before. Um, we are now just printing out hello world on the command line. Okay. So this is our very first Python program. You see, I've used the editor. I've just written the command over here. I execute it using F5 and I see the output of my program in the console down here. If you're interested in seeing other Hello World programs in other programming languages, there is a nice collection of Hello World programs available on this website and you can see that python 3 hello world is shown here that's exactly what we have typed at the moment and this collection demonstrates as well that dependent on the programming language you use a hello world program can be quite complicated so let's have a look at uh, this one here assembler set 80 console this is another way to write a computer program and what you see here is the code that would be required to print out hello world on the console. So uh, as you can see, Python in comparison is a very nice and easy looking programming language. Imagine you had to write computer code of this form. That would be quite daunting, I think. 
Okay, so let's go back to our Python Hello World program and look at a more complete version that is given here. You see, we have still our line print Hello World, but there's some other stuff here. So what is this about? Well, it turns out the first line actually has no meaning on Windows, but it is useful on Linux or Mac OS because it makes your programs easier to run. So it is completely up to you whether or not you want to include these lines in your Python codes. On Windows, this would be optional. Then we have an empty line here. Empty lines are completely ignored by the Python interpreter. So when your code is being run, empty lines are basically just skipped. Okay, so this empty line here has no meaning for us. And then we have these triple quotation marks and closing some text. Now this is what is called a doc string in Python. It is a description of what your program is doing. You can imagine that if you have a code that is, let's say, a hundred lines long, or maybe half a million lines of code, then you don't want anyone to go through this code from top to bottom, having to read it in order to understand what your code is actually doing. That's why doc strings are very important in order to document what is going on. We have another empty line here that would be ignored. And then we have our print hello world command as before. So if I copy and paste this to our spider window and I run it, then it will do exactly the same as before. Right, you see that this line here is ignored, empty lines are ignored, and everything that is written in the doc string is also completely ignored by the Python interpreter. Now, sometimes you will notice when you create new files in Spider, in particular, when you create new files like that, you will have this first line over here. Okay. And then Spider has actually already created an empty doc string for us that we can fill out and complete. So this first line here refers to the encoding that the Python script is being written in. You can delete it, um, but it's also no harm leaving it in there. I recommend leaving it in. We will not discuss encodings in this course, but if you ever happen to have a choice when deciding on which encoding to use, um, UTF-8 is the best encoding that you can use for writing Python codes at the moment. Sometimes we want to add some human language nodes in our code, and these nodes are called comments in Python. Comments help us help the programmers to read the code, and they are completely ignored by the computer. In Python, Comments are made by prepending a hash sign in front of it. Each of these comments ends with the end of the line. Now, many of you will be non-native English speakers, but I would highly recommend that when you write comments in your Python code, then you should choose English as your standard language. There is actually a Python style guide, guide called PAP, and uh, I've taken this here from the guide, saying that Python coders from non-English speaking countries, please write your comments in English unless you are 100% sure that the code will never be read by people who don't speak your language. Okay, so please write your comments in English, not using another language for that. So here is the same Hello World program uh, with Again, a doc string, which explains what the program is doing, but also a few more comments. So here is one. You see, we have the hashtag line, and then we are explaining that we are going to produce a welcome message. And then we have our print hello world command as before, which prints the string hello world to the console. And then we have a final comment, which tells us that we need to do something. We need to ask um, the user for their name and we want to save it to a file. That's just our own working notes that we have put in here. Maybe we want to continue working on this code tomorrow. So we put a little to do there telling us what we should do when we wake up next day. Now, these predefined strings to do, for example, there are also others like fix me, note, triple X. These are so-called tags. Okay, and tags are 
commonly used in computer programming projects in order to identify certain parts of the code. So clearly, if you write to do somewhere, then it would indicate to another programmer usually that something needs to be done with this part of the code. If you write fix me, then this would mark a potential problem in the code that requires special attention and so on. Now, the reason it's convenient to have these tags standardized is that you can just use the search option in your code in order to find them quickly, right? So if I have this piece of code here, and let's say my program is much longer, so I have a lot of code here at the moment, it's just empty, but imagine there are a lot of lines of code here, and I just want to find all the places where I still need to work on, I can use the search option in Spider to find all the to-dos very quickly. Right, so it's good to stick to some predefined tags so you can easily recover them from your files. Now, how should a well-written comment look like? Well, comments should always be descriptive and they should definitely not just be a rewriting of the code in English language. So here is an example. This, uh, these here are three lines of Python code that do something. We don't need to worry too much about this now. But uh, there is a comment above these lines, which tells us that these lines get the sum of the primes in L as prime sum. L turns out to be a list, and we will learn more about lists later. And prime sum is a variable. Okay. Now, this is a good example of a comment, because I don't need to carefully read this piece of code here, this here summarizes very briefly what um, the following code is actually doing. And even someone who doesn't speak Python can understand what is going on here. Now here is another comment spanning two lines. See, you need to make, you need to put a hash there for every line of your comment, if you use this format. And this reads as follows, for each element x in the list, if x is a prime number, add it to the prime sum. Now, this is a bad comment because I might as well just read the code here, right? This says something about for each x in L, we check if x is a prime number and we add it to the variable prime sum. So that's basically just a rewriting of the same thing in English. So in some sense, this comment here is useless. Now, remember that an important component of an algorithm was to get some data. How do we input data in Python? Well, not surprisingly, this is done using the function input. Every function in Python has a pre-specified name. In this case, it is input, and then it is followed by round brackets. Okay, these round brackets need to be there in order to call a function. So what we have here in this two-line Python, uh, two -line Python code is to get the input from the user, via their computer keyboard and then assign it to a variable which is called x here and then we would call another function print again followed by round brackets and this print function here takes two inputs the first one is a string saying the value of x is comma so this function can actually take more than one input argument x which is the variable that we have inputted just before that. So let's copy and paste this to spider and see what happens when I run this code. It appears as if nothing is happening, right? Apparently there is no reaction in the console, but very carefully we can look at this red square here and uh, we will notice that this square is actually not red when nothing is being executed. So this red square is an indication that the Python interpreter is waiting for something. Either we are stuck somewhere in the code because maybe we have an infinite loop going on or the console is actually waiting for some input. Turns out that the latter is the case here because we have this input command here and you see this blinking cursor here Okay, this indicates that we are now able to type something. So I'm gonna type 17, for example, and then I will hit enter. And this hitting the enter button has the effect that the input function will stop asking the user 
for their keystrokes, it will assign the input that we have done to the variable x and then it will continue to line 2 where it's printing out the value of x is comma which appends two strings x okay and what you see as a result here is this output the value of x is 17 so that works this works as we would expect now 17 looks like a number but it is actually a so-called string we can easily test this i'm gonna type now something else okay random string and when i hit enter then we get the output the value of x is something else now in spider um, there are different data types that can be used for variables every variable has a value and a type okay, this is very important to remember that there are always two components and there are different data types available for example there are numbers if you want to store data that corresponds to integers or floating point numbers as shown here, then you would of course store them using a number data type. Another data type in Python are strings. Strings are always defined using quotes. So if you want to define a string variable, you would start it with a quote. Then you have your character sequence, for example, word, and then you have a closing quote there, which would end the definition of a string. And strings can be of arbitrary length, as shown here. If you want to define an empty string, so that's a string that doesn't contain any characters, you would just type two double quotes next to each other. There are so-called Boolean variables, which can hold truth values that are either true or false. Important, in Python, these truth values need to be spelled exactly as written here. So you have a capital T-R-U-E or you have a capital F-A-L-S-E for true and false. And finally, there is a funny data type called non-type, which has only one value that is associated with it called none. Okay. None refers to no value and it is not a zero or an empty string or anything else. None is different from any other constant or any other value that one can define in Python. And I alluded to this before, 17, when stored as a variable value, would be a number, while this here is a string that just happens to contain the characters 17. Now, if we go back to spider, you can click here on variable explorer and you get a nice list of all the variables that are currently stored in your computer's memory and you see we have a variable called x which has a value something else that's exactly what we typed in here right and the data type of x is str which stands for string okay so x is a string variable There are also slightly more complicated data types, for example, lists and tuples, dictionaries, set, objects, and functions. We will discuss them in the near future. Now you might wonder, how do these Python variables actually work? How can I use them to store and work with my own data? In order to get some better understanding, let's analyze this code that we have seen before with the input function assignment to a variable x and then printing out the value. The way Python interprets or reads this code is line by line starting with the first line. So when you run this script in Spider, it will start looking at the first line. Now what do we have in the first line? We have what is called an assignment, which is this operator here. Now whenever Python encounters an assignment, it will first look on the right hand side of that assignment. So on the right of the assignment, we have the input function. The input function, as we have already seen, reads a sequence of characters from the input, which is usually the user's keyboard, and returns it as a string variable. This returned string variable will be assigned in value to the variable x that we have defined here. 
Okay, so we take whatever this input function returns and assign it to the variable x. Now, because this input function returns a string, this variable x will be a string variable. And then we have completed the first line and Spider can continue, or Python can continue to look at the second line. What it has then to deal with is a print function. Now, what are the arguments of this print function? Well, Python will look inside the round brackets here and realize there are two input parameters. And by default, the print function will concatenate these two parameters, these two strings into one string. And it turns out the way it's doing that is it takes the first input argument, which is a string saying the value of x is. Then it will add a single space character after the string. So that's just a string of length one that has just a single character being the space bar. And then it will append the string contained in the variable x. Note that x, of course, is not printed out. The value of x will be printed out to the console. So if we type 17, and I'm going to just do this one more time, and I hit enter, then you'll see that there is this additional space character between is, the last word in the first string, and the value 17 that we have inputted. So when you use this concatenation of strings using commas within the print command, then you will always have some additional spaces added between your strings. Now look again at this variable explorer. Again, the variable is called x as before, and its value is 17, but note that the type is string. Although this value 17 could also correspond to an integer value, it is actually stored as a string. Now, just to re-emphasize this again, even if a value looks like a number, it might not actually be a number. Let's look at this short Python program here, which now consists of three lines. And what I've done here is I have added strings as input parameters for the input function. Now, what this does is it will create this string. It will output the string on the command line so that the user actually knows what we are asking for. So let's execute this. And now you see here we have this prompt printed out on the console. Please tell us what is the value of x you want to input. So, OK, let's take 17 as before. And once this line is completed, Python will proceed to line number two, where we are now asking for the value of the variable y we want to define. Let's put 19 here. Okay. So we are done with this line. If I hit enter, we would proceed to the third line. But before doing this, let's have a look at line three and try to understand what the output, output will be. We are calling again the print command, and now we have multiple input arguments here. This works exactly as before. We will just concatenate all these inputs. So it will print the value of x. It will then add a space, then concatenate a string containing just a plus symbol. It will then add another space, concatenate the value of y, add another space, concatenate a string of length one just containing the equals character adding another space and then concatenating the value of x plus y. So it should print out something like x plus y equals to x plus y. Now, what do we expect as an output? Well, I guess it will output 17 plus 19 equals, but what is x plus y? Remember, x and y are not stored as integers, although their variables could be represented as integers. These will be stored as strings. Now, when you add up two strings, what you really get is a concatenation of two strings. So when we hit enter here, the output is 17, 19. It's not the sum of 17 and 19 as you might have expected, simply because X and Y are string variables that just happen to store some values that could correspond to strings.
So Python is not doing anything clever here. Just because the value corresponds to a number, it's not just, it's not starting to treat the addition of two strings, which is by default concatenation in, in a way different from anything else. So if I type here the value of x being Bruce, let's say, and this corresponding to Wayne, and of course we get Bruce Wayne as the output. It's just concatenating these strings. If we want to add up two variables in the sense of standard addition, then we need to make sure that their corresponding data types are number data types. And converting a string variable into a number data type is very easy in Python. There are a couple of functions that are available for us, which are called int, float, and then there is also the possibility to convert a number back to a string, and there is the so-called str function for this purpose. So we can convert back and forth between different data types using these three functions. So here is an example. And let's, before we run this, let's just walk through this step by step. Again, uh, Python will interpret this piece of code line by line, starting from the first line. And there is an assignment, so Python will decide to first look at the right-hand side of this assignment. Now, on the right-hand side of this assignment, I have the int function, which can be used to convert a string into an input integer output. And within uh, the int function, we have as an input argument the output of the input function. So really what happens here when the Python interpreter tries to make sense of that is it will first execute this input function, which we have already seen what it does. It will prompt the user to input something in the console. And once we hit enter, it will return the corresponding string. This string will then be given as an input parameter to the int function which will do its best converting the string into an integer argument. And once we have this integer value, we will assign it to the variable x. Now, if this is completed, we can proceed to the second line, where we again ask for an input, which we then convert from the string data type that is returned into a floating point number. Now, a floating point number is something like 17.23, right? So a number with a decimal uh, digit. And um, this conversion can, of course, only be successful if what we have inputted in some way or another actually corresponds to a floating point number. Then we will call the print function several times. We will output the value of x and y, and then we will print the sum of x and y. Now let's run this code and I'm going to input, let's say 17. That's now the variable X that I have assigned and maybe minus 19.12. And now you see that line number five, which actually computes the sum of both of these variables X and Y has computed what we expected, right? It has taken 17 and added minus 19.12 um, to this number, and that's the result that we get. It should really be minus 2.12, but then you see we get lots of zeros and then number one here. Uh, this is an effect that is inherent to computation with floating point numbers, and we will talk a little bit about this later on at the end of these lecture notes. But you have seen that it is possible, quite easily possible, to convert between different data types. And if you now inspect what we have in memory, looking at the variable explorer, you'll find that x is an integer variable, as we expect after this conversion here. y is a floating point number containing the value minus 19.12, and z, which is what we have computed here is a string. So what do we do in line number six? In line number six, we concatenate a string with another string, which is x plus y that 
will of course be a floating point number, right? If I add an integer and a floating point number, the result will in general be a floating point number and I convert it back to a string. Okay? Because these two are strings now, I can use the addition operator to concatenate them. And the concatenation is what is being printed out on the console. There is a more efficient and more elegant way to concatenate strings that we will learn about later when we discuss the format function for strings. Variables can only hold exactly one value. So if we inspect the following four lines of code here, we can understand what this means in practice. Let's just copy and paste this to Spider and then discuss this step by step. So the Python interpreter again will try to run through this program line by line, starting with the first line. Now, what do we have in the first line? In the first line, we have an assignment operator. And to Python, this just means that we have to first look at the right hand side of this assignment and see what we have there. On the right hand side of the assignment, we have the value 17. Now, 17 is a value that can be interpreted as an integer. So Python will think of 17 as an integer value and assign it to an integer variable called x. After line one is being completed, we will have an integer variable x in memory. Python can then proceed to line number two, where it will print out the concatenation of the string, the value of x was, a space and x. Now, when we use an integer variable within the print command as an input argument, Python will do the conversion to string automatically for us. So this will actually work. We are concatenating here a string and an integer value by first converting this integer value x to a string and then concatenating it with the first string and a space character. After line two is being completed, we can move on to line number three. Again, in line number three, we have an assignment operator. So Python will look on the right hand side of this assignment operator and find that it should compute x. So whatever is stored in the variable x plus two. So of course, this will return the value 19, which again is an integer value. And this integer value of 19 will be assigned to the variable x. So at this point, we have assigned the variable value 19 to the variable x, which previously was holding the value 17. But because variables can only store one value, this value of 17 will be overwritten by the new value 19. So after line three is completed, the variable x will hold the value 19, and we have no way to actually get back to the value 17 that was stored before it's erased. So running this code, we'll find that it outputs the value of x was 17. That's outputted by line number two. And as we reach nine, line number four, it will output the value of x is 19. Note that um, we have created an integer variable x here, and you can see this in the variable explorer, x holds the value 17, and it is of type int, which is an integer variable. Now this operation of taking a variable, let's say x, and adding a number to it, appears very often in programming. For example, if we count things, in order to make our code a little bit more, let's see, easy to read or efficient, whatever you want to call it, you can instead also type this in Python. You can contract x is assigned the value of x plus 1 into this shorter expression here, x plus assignment 1. Okay. So after this code is being executed, x will hold the value of 18. Now, I haven't shown you this before, but you can interactively also use the console on the bottom right of Spider in order to work with variables. So, for example, I can type here print x. x is still in memory, it's available here, and this, of course, will output 18. Re 
Notice also that we have previous variables still in memory. So the variable y that we have defined in some previous example is still there. It's a floating point number holding the value minus 19.12. And also the variable z that we had defined previously is a string containing these characters. Just as one can contract the addition of two numbers into a shorter version shown here on the right of this table, one can also contract subtraction, multiplication, division, and many other operations that are available within Python. Now, personally, I usually prefer to use the longer expressions shown on the left. I don't really find that one saves a lot by contracting variables that have only a single character name. They are mainly useful, these contractions, when you have variable names that are much longer than just one character. So I show you an example in Spider. So if I have a variable that has a very long name, this is a variable with a long name. Uh, that would be a completely valid variable name. See, note that you can use um, letters in variable names. You can also have numbers in here. It is not allowed to start a variable with a number. Okay, it needs to be somewhere inside the variable variable name. And of course, it's not possible to have spaces. So this is not a variable name that is valid. And very often we use underscores in order to separate words. An alternative is to use so-called the camel case naming of variables, where you, you would just uppercase every starting letter of every word in your variable name, like this, for example. Right. So the, these are all valid variable names that can be used. Now, if I want to increment this variable by one, if I use the old way, it would be quite a long line of code to read. Right? So here it really makes sense to contract this into something much shorter of this form. But if your variable name is just X or Y, then I would just use the long version, really. Alongside the standard arithmetic operations like addition and multiplication that basically behave as you would expect within Python 3, there are some special arithmetic operators that we need to learn about. They will be very important in the exercises that we will be going through in the next weeks. These operators are the so-called float quotient of X and Y, which in Python is defined or used like that. You have two variables, x and y, say, and you want to compute the float quotient of um, x and y, then you simply need to use the doubled forward slash operator as shown here. This corresponds to integer division in the sense that you take the quotient of x and y and you round down. Then there is the remainder uh, of x divided by y, so the remainder after division, which is obtained in Python using this percentage symbol. And if we want to raise a variable x to the power y, we use a double star here, and it's x to the power y. So let's have a look at these operators in Spider and play around with them. So I'll do this now in the console because we just want to type it actively. If I type five divided by two, then I'm dividing two integer variables here. And of course, um, the result 2.5 cannot be represented as an integer variable. And therefore I will have a floating point number as the result. And we can really check that this is a floating point number by assigning this value to a variable, let's say a, and then looking in the variable explorer, which tells us that the variable a indeed is a floating point number. Okay, now if I want the float quotient, I need to use this double forward slash operator. Now what this does is it will divide five by two, get 2.5 and then round down that's, and that's why we get the value of two here. Now this 
double forward slash operator will always return an integer variable and you can confirm this in the variable explorer. What's the remainder after division by two, four, five? Well, as we expect, this is one, right? Because two times two is equal to four. And if I add one, I end up at five. Now care has to be taken when working with negative numbers. What is the float quotient of minus seven divided by two? Well, uh, minus seven divided by two is minus 3.5. Remember, we are rounding downwards. So what we get as an answer will be minus four. Okay, so double check when you use these operations that you actually get what you intend to compute, especially when negative numbers are involved here. Now, let me do a brief recap of what we have learned so far. We started off with the print function, which takes as input arguments a list of variables or strings and just prints them out to the console. That's how we wrote our very first Hello World program. Recall that if you have, for example, two variables that you're printing out, then they are concatenated, so just glued together, but with a space character in between. That was the print command. We also learned about input, which is another function that prompts the user to type something on their keyboard, which is then returned by the input function as a string. Okay, so very important. The input function returns strings. We have learned about variables. And the most important aspect here is that every variable has its data type and value, right? This is common to every variable and every variable can only store exactly one value. Now there were different data types that we learned about, such as integers, floating point numbers, strings, Boolean variables, and the funny data type called non-type. Okay. We will learn more about non later on in the course. At the moment, don't worry about this too much. Now, we also learned about conversions between different data types. So each of these types here has a corresponding conversion function associated to it. For example, if we have a string variable that corresponds to a boolean value then we can use the bool function to convert into true or false or likewise if we have an integer we can convert it into a string variable using the str function so it is very easy to convert back and forth between different types of variables we have learned about arithmetic operations like addition of two variables, which is different for two strings or for two floating point numbers. It really depends on the data type what the addition of two variables will return. Of course, you can subtract, you can multiply and so on. We also learned about the float division using the double forward slash operator and about the remainder after division using the percentage operator. And we learned about raising a variable to the power of another variable using the double star operator here. The most important operator that we have learned about so far is the so-called assignment, which is indicated by this equal symbol. However, it doesn't actually correspond to equal. This is really meant to be read as the assignment operator. So we can use it to assign a value of a variable to another. So for example, here we would assign the value of y to x. And the assignment operator in Python is always read from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. When working with floating point numbers on a computer, one must be extremely careful. The reason for this is that it is impossible to store any real number on a computer. We can only store a finite subset of the real numbers. And on our computer, these would be the floating point numbers. Every time we perform a numerical operation using a floating point number, 
there will be some rounding involved. And this is even the case when we do simple calculations like this. A plus B minus A for two floating point numbers, A and B. I just demonstrate you in Spider what the effects of this look like. So let's say we have two variables, A and B. Just to recall, A would be an integer variable here and B is a floating point number. And what I'm going to do now is I will just compute A plus B minus A. What do we expect the answer to be? Well, A plus B should be 10.1. And now if I take off A, I expect the result to be 0 0.1, right? The value of B. Let's see what we get. We get 0 0.0999999 and so on, and then 64. So this is a number that is very, very close to 0 0.1, the correct result we expected, but it is not equal to 0 0.1. So here we encounter some floating point error. Let's try another example. Let's take a very large number A, for example, 10 to the power 11. And let's take a very small number B, like 10 to the power minus 11. Again, I will compute A plus B minus A, and what we get is 0. Surely this is not right. B is a non-zero number. Although it's very small, it's certainly not equal to 0. Let's try another example. Let's say X is some arbitrary integer, let's say 474953, and I define y to be 1 over x, and then I will print out x times y. What do we expect as the answer? Certainly, we would expect the number 1 as the result of this computation. What we now get is 0 0.99999 and so on, a number that is fairly close to the exact answer 1, but certainly not identical to 1. So all of these effects have to do with numerical rounding. And I don't have time in this lecture to go into details of floating point arithmetic. If you're very interested in this, you should follow the numerical analysis courses that are available at our university. But just to give you a brief insight what is going on here, let me remark that floats always have a finite precision. Okay. We can never represent um, floating point numbers to arbitrary precision. So to give an example, let's assume we have a computer who represents floating point numbers using four digits of precision. And let's say I want to add up to floating point numbers like 1.254 and 100. Now both of these numbers are given in at most four digits of precision. I could even write here 100.0. That would be still a number that is specified to four digits of precision. Sure enough, we can do this computation in our head. So the result of this addition would be 101.254, right? Now, when we do this calculation on a computer, what will happen is we will perform rounding after every arithmetic operation that we are performing. So we would compute this sum using a finite memory, storing only a finite amount of digits, which might be slightly higher uh, than 4. But at the end, we would round it back to the working precision of four digits. So if I round this result back to four digits, it would be 101.3. The digit five that follows the two would cause a rounding up to the decimal three that I'm showing here. So certainly this is not the same as this one. We have incurred some rounding error. Now, the consequence of this is that we have to be very careful when we perform floating point operations. And if we can, then we should perform operations using integers as much as possible.
Here is an example in the lecture notes that I invite you to try out yourself at home. It's a way to compute the nth Fibonacci number. And in fact, there are two ways of doing that. Perhaps you are familiar with the Fibonacci sequence. It is defined as follows. The zeroth Fibonacci number is defined as zero. The first one is equal to one. And then the n plus first Fibonacci number is obtained by computing the sum of the previous two. This is the well-known Fibonacci sequence. There is indeed also a direct formula to compute the nth Fibonacci number, which is shown here. It involves these constants phi and psi corresponding to the golden section ratio. And it turns out that the nth Fibonacci number can also be computed using this formula here, which involves the nth power of phi and psi. Now, mathematically, these two ways of computing Fibonacci numbers are completely equivalent. You can use either way, but on a computer, they will behave very differently. Let's demonstrate this again using Spider. I will copy and paste these two function definitions over here. We haven't really learned about functions yet, but um, what this code here is doing is it is defining two functions, one called Fib1, which uses the first approach to computing the nth Fibonacci number following the sum recursion. And it defines a second function called Fib2, which uses the golden section ratio formula that was our second way of computation. When I run this script, seemingly nothing has happened. In fact, I have only defined the two functions Fib1 and Fib2 in memory now, and I can now call them like any other Python function. So I can type fib1 with an input argument of 8, and it should return the 8th eight Fibonacci number, which happens to be 21. I can also try fib2. Let's get the 8th Fibonacci number using the golden section formula. Again, that's 21. So these two seem to agree. In fact, they agree perfectly. But now let's try this for a larger input argument n. So what is the uh, 75th Fibonacci number computed using the sum recursion formula? This happens to be a rather large integer shown here. And now let's do the same using the Fib2 function. Again with input argument 75 and see what we get. Well, it looks fairly similar but indeed, this is not the same number as the previously computed. So the fib2 function and the fib1 function do not return the same result for the 75th Fibonacci number. Now, the immediate question is, which of these two functions is right? It turns out it is the first one. The first function only involves integer computations. The first Fibonacci number is initialized to be an integer zero, f1 is also initialized to be an integer 1, and from this step onwards, we are only performing integer addition. So whenever we add integers, there is no need for any rounding, and floating integer numbers in Python can be stored to arbitrary length. You can have arbitrarily large um, integers within Python. So there is no problem computing the 75th Fibonacci number using these 75 additions. Whereas the second function involving phi and psi clearly involves floating point arithmetic. These numbers, I can just print you out what they look like, getting them here. Okay, just computing, trying to compute them. Okay, so let's get the square root of five and then let's compute phi over here. That turns out to be the golden section ratio. This is a floating point number. And as a consequence, what we are computing here is also a floating point number. And therefore we should not blindly trust this computation. In the lecture notes, if you're interested in this topic a bit more, there are some other examples involving addition of sums that have many, many terms. There is an example that shows that addition 
isn't even associative. So when you change the order of addition um, in floating point computations, you might get different results. And there are some examples involving powers of numbers. And again, you can get horrendous rounding errors by computing expressions of this form. Now you might wonder, these errors looked pretty tiny. Uh, do they really matter in practice? Um, yes, they do. And if you're interested, at the end of the lecture notes, there is a link to this website here, which um, collects catastrophic consequences of floating point computations and rounding errors that have accumulated to produce some outputs that were not really intended. So please have a look at this website as well if you want to learn what can possibly go wrong when you're not careful with floating point computations. Now, just to sum up, um, of course, it does not mean that we should avoid using floating point numbers altogether. I'm just saying one needs to be careful and a large part of numerical analysis is concerned with algorithms implemented in a way that rounding errors do not grow arbitrarily large and that they are kept under control. So if you're interested in this, please follow the course Numerical Analysis 1 as a starting point where you will learn much more about stable computations using floating point arithmetic. Thank you very much.